hold up. <laughs> Thanks so much. So we're going to go to our questions now, and uh, we're tight for uh, the hour ahead of us. And I don't have the uh, first conservative speaker, so who is... That would be me, Mr. Go Schmiel. ahead, Mr. Mr. Schmiel. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and good morning, Minister. It's great to see you both again. Um, maybe I'll start with Minister Bennett, if I could. Um, Minister, um, talking about the $27 million uh, that was uh, released, uh, I guess, last week, um, it was previously announced funding to uncover what are believed to be thousands of Indigenous children buried in unmarked graves at residential schools across the country. Minister, um, why did it take two years to release that money? Thank you for the question. And I think that what we had been told uh, obviously was that we needed to get money to the to the NCTR to be able to work on the registries. but our advice was that we needed to go to communities, uh, to experts, to make sure that the design of the program would be respectful um, and, and would meet the needs of communities. And in that engagement, uh, last over last year, we were able to determine that they wanted it. It had to be Indigenous-led, community-based, survivor-centric, as well as culturally sensitive. And they wanted the flexibility to know that that whatever that community needed would be um, funded in a in a in a in a in a way that met the needs of that community. And so things like whether it's gatherings, commemoration, whether it's research or whether it's archaeological expertise, that there is this it will be a very flexible program that was launched last Wednesday. And we really want communities to know that we'll be there to support them in their way forward. But what was the delay, the fact that it was announced two years ago and previously announced funding, and all of a sudden it was made ready? Like, it was it just coincidence that it's just all of a sudden made? Or what happened? Well, it, what happens is that you need to design the program, then you need to go to Treasury Board, and then and all of that was was taking place since I met with the NCTR and 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 with former Commissioner Marie Wilson in November of last year, we then designed the program based on the very best advice we have, and then it was able to be released um, last week. So okay, um, that's uh, but you understand where I'm coming here. Like you, the, it was previously announced two years ago, and it finally got uh, finalized and released, ready to go. But it 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 almost seemed like it it took that tragedy, that discovery, in order for the government to finally release that cash. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll move on because I do have a number of other questions here. Um, as you know, uh, our leader, Aaron O'Toole, wrote to the prime minister um, asking a number of things, four points uh, specifically. The one I wanted to ask about is the, the plan to address the TRC calls to action 71 through 76 and develop a concrete action plan um, by July 1st. Uh, is that something the government is able to commit to? Well, Jamie, 71 is a provincial one that is dealing with the corners. Um, that is not under federal purview. Um, 72 to 76, um, as I explained, we're well on our on our way. Uh, it is a uh, it is the money that has gone to the National Center on Truth and Reconciliation in terms of the being able to to uh, develop the the death registries as well as there's more money going forward to them as they as they do their important work uh, as well as the the money that that was in the um, um, this recent announcement to, to go to communities and. So when we look at um, the 72 to 76, we really do believe we have a plan to be able to honor um, what was was in those calls to action. So can you commit to that action plan, uh, releasing it to the public, to us, uh, that of July 1st of this year, you will have a, a, a concrete roadmap on how you're going to get there? Absolutely, Jamie. We we have a plan for every one of the calls to action uh, with it, that is federal responsibility or um, shared responsibility. And we're, as you know, we're well 
uh, either completed or well underway with 80% of them. Uh, obviously, what happened just now with C5, C8, as well as C15, we are making tremendous progress on the on the calls to action, and uh, and we really do believe that that uh, that calls to action 72 to 76 are well underway. Well, Minister, prior to the announcement of the that the 27 million that uh, previously announced funding two years ago, sorry to bounce back to that, um, how much of uh, Outside that 27 million, how much funding has already gone out to communities to assist invest, investigating unmarked graves across uh, Canada? As as we understand, um, as you know, that Tecumlips, um community did receive $40,000 uh, from Heritage Canada, actually, in the Pathways to Healing. So there have been many different avenues, but this money and the budget 2019 is is um, is dedicated exactly to to uh, calls to action 72 to 76. So, Minister, as you know, the to come loops First Nation is paying for security uh, and commemorations and other costs associated with the discovery of, of those graves. Um, they've asked for short term funding, which I'm sure you know, um, uh, from the government to assist them with that. Um, is, is that something the government is investigating? If yes, has money been provided? Uh, if no, is there a timeline on when they might see that? We're over time, so quick answer, please. Sure. Um, Minister Miller and his department are providing whatever um, uh, the Tecumlips needs in terms of security, mental health supports, um, and and we will work uh, um, with the Kupke Kazmir on on anything around gatherings or 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 the kind of commemoration that they are planning. Thanks very much, Mr. Pelosi. Six minutes. My questions are for Minister Bennett or perhaps Mr. Quan Watson can answer these questions. Uh, former Senator Murray Sinclair, in a recent statement related to finding the bodies in Kamloops. Um, suggested that the churches have documents that they haven't disclosed related um, to missing and um, dead children. Do we believe, and, and I've actually heard also the suggestion that, that perhaps even the Vatican has such documents. Do we believe that there are such documents out there and what have we done in order to try to secure those documents? Well, as the, um, as the prime minister as stated, and he he reached out to the Canadian Council of Bishops and spoke with them on Monday. I think that we've been very clear that that we expect the church to release all relevant documents. I understand that the diocese in Vancouver is is um, open to that. We are hearing um, from the bishops in the north their willingness. Uh, I I do believe that we need these documents from the church. Um, the Canadian government has handed over all relevant documents, and it it is really time that that in order to to do the work of identifying these lost children, the records that the churches hold must be handed over, and 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 we will continue to pursue that. Do we have the legal power now to require the churches? to release such documents. And if we don't have the legal power, we, I would suggest certainly in Parliament have the ability to give ourselves the legal power to require the churches to hand over those documents. Are, are there any such plans or do, do you think the laws already exist? Well, my understanding um, is that the, our, uh, our legal options to compel documents are pretty limited. But I, I think maybe the the officials could explain if there are any pathways that are open to us. And perhaps I could ask uh, Monsieur Riard, uh, who has followed this file closely for a long time, to jump in here. Thank you, Deputy Minister. If I may, uh, Mr. Chair, I would add to the answer that um, uh, churches um, had obligations to disclose uh, documents in the context of the litigation that led to the uh, Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement and under that agreement. And uh, the legal power that uh, the government uh, would have at this time to compel uh, the Catholic Church to um, produce documents uh, would be to file a request for direction 
um, with the supervising court to compel uh, the, uh, the production. Uh, if documents were located outside of Canada, of course, that becomes much more complicated, uh, complicated in terms of uh, jurisdiction. Sorry, to, so just to clarify, you say on, on the previous litigation, there was a requirement to disclose documents and, and those can still be accessed now through that previous litigation? I'm just not sure what the response meant. Thank you. The documents uh, that were disclosed as part of the litigation were gathered and under the uh, uh, settlement agreement, a lot of research was done both by uh, the uh, federal government and by the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and over 5 million documents were gathered and transferred to the NCTR. So there is already a lot of historical information that uh, is available. Uh, so this is the document collection I was referring to. If there are other documents that uh, exist that were not disclosed, maybe uh, the, the legal power that we would have would be to um, to go through the, um, to the court, through the uh, processes under the uh, settlement agreement to compel uh, additional disclosure. So you think the power already exists through through the previous agreement to 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 require the churches to disclose? That is the power that we would have at this time to under the settlement agreement, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement uh, document relating to Indian Residential School um, had to be disclosed, and uh, if not all were disclosed, that is the recourse that we would have. Minister, you, we, we have set aside $27 million for further investigations to, to see if there are, and certainly there, there will be other um, graveyards or, or, or bodies found. Um, can you tell us, it hasn't been that long since the bodies were discovered in Kamloops, but have other Indigenous groups so far come forward to ask for funding um, to look for further sites? Yes, unfortunately, Marcus, uh, that there in in the Kamloops that there had been that knowing for over twenty years, and they'd begun that work. I think that uh, that we are already seeing um, requests coming from Saskatchewan, from Six Nations, that uh, that this is um, this is unfortunately very prevalent. I think as we go across the country and see even the marked grades of the the small crosses there in the cemeteries adjacent to where the schools were it is heartbreaking but as the truth and reconciliation commission said there are just thousands probably of of unmarked graves and uh and 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 remains uh that uh, yet to be discovered that uh, brings us to time and we go now to madame berube six minutes Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and the Cree, among others, and I'm currently in my riding of Val d'Or. We are all affected, sadly, by the loss of these 215 children which whose remains were recently discovered, and it was very disconcerting. In memory of these children, we need to know the truth and help the communities and, most importantly, listen to them. My question is for Minister Bennett. Hello, ma'am. The community still doesn't have running water and electricity because in the eyes of the white community, they are squatters. And it's ridiculous because it is their own lands. Can you please tell me... But why things aren't moving? Why things aren't moving forward for Kitsizikik? Thank you. Thank you for the excellent question. It is the lack of utilities and drinking water and other things. It is very important. It's a priority. It's an approach from Minister Miller and I and Minister Vandal. And it is an issue 
an, a crucial one. And I hope that in the future, a specific response will be found for this community And I hope, I, in fact, I promise I will find an answer for you. Thank you, Madam Minister. And you also know it's important that Kitsiza Kik is an invisible community in the eyes of the government often. And this is a direct consequence of the terrible living conditions they're in. No support. And in order to settle this situation, it's very important that it be dealt with on a government level. I'd also like to thank you for your presence today before the committee. Last year, I don't know if you recall, but I had raised the issue of comprehensive land claims, and you said that you agreed with me on this subject. What has your department done to update this uh, policy since March of 2020 when we spoke on it? If I could have an answer, please. Perhaps you could repeat the question, ma'am. This is about the comprehensive land claims. I had brought up the issue on the comprehensive land claims policy. Yes. This is absolutely critical. We are making progress with the claims throughout the communities. And it's possible for me to lay out the, I can give you a description and the progress made. We would really appreciate that. My next question is for Minister Vandal. You, earlier, you spoke about Louis Riel as a Quebecer. I can just reiterate the historical uh, connection between the Métis and, and Quebecers. Now, there was an unfair execution of Louis Riel. Do you not think that it would be time for the federal government to finally present its apologies and exonerate Louis Riel? Yes, thank you for this excellent question. What I can say is that the elected Métis government or direct descendants of uh, Louis Riel want, neither of them want exoneration for him. We respect the self-government and independence of indigenous peoples. I know that it's a significant matter. There are important discussions that are happening within communities. I would say that it's up to the Métis community to give us uh, direction on their perspective. I can't hear you. Pardon me. My question is for Ms. Bennett. We were talking about C-15 which is currently before the other chamber. I've got two questions on this. First, are you confident that the bill will get royal assent by the end of this parliamentary session? And will there be a commitment that uh, C-15 be approved by the uh, Governor General? The committee and Madam Bay Roubaix, I'm so sorry. Uh, the bells are ringing. Uh, I'll give Miss um, Bennett uh, just a half a minute to try to <laughs> respond, and we will continue on until approximately five minutes before the actual vote. Uh, we're in around 27 minutes. There's a half-hour bell, so that will certainly give Miss Mumalak, uh, Miss uh, Kakak, uh, the opportunity to ask her questions. But once again, uh, Miss Bennett, uh, did you pick up uh, Madam Bay Rubais? We oui. merci pour. Yes, thank you for your question. I think Minister LeBlanc said last Saturday that it's the 
that the candidates include the possibility of a governor general who is indigenous. And we're waiting. And also, for your question about the comprehensive land claims, it's a subsidy for all First Nations for their commitments first, and then for revisions of our federal policies. Mr. Clerk, do we need a motion? With re the bells are, are ringing. I just want to make sure we're proceeding. Um, if members are in agreement to, to proceed as you suggest, um, then, then that's absolutely acceptable. One objecting. I don't see an objection. Ms. Kakak, please go ahead for six minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Ministers, for being here. And your um, speech has been so far answers. The Prime Minister has stated that your government has the tools and processes to force the Catholic Church to disclose remaining residential schools documents. Minister Bennett, the Prime Minister said that he would only use these tools when it is necessary. Why don't you view this as necessary now when Indigenous children are found dead? Thank you so much for the question. And I, you know, I think that we are um, asking the Catholic Church to release the documents if there are any documents that that have not, as as Martin said, uh, been already um, released to the to as part of the settlement agreement uh, uh, class action. So I I think that uh, we need to know um, what what might be there and be able to proceed. This will be essential in being able to identify those lost children. So I'm specifically asking why your government isn't viewing it as necessary, quote unquote. As an Indigenous person, Minister Bennett, it's really insulting that you are deciding what is necessary when I and Indigenous people across the nation are telling you that this is necessary. Do you believe that family member records are the family member's property? Are these documents not the churches, not the government? These are ours, Indigenous peoples. Why are you, as a non-Indigenous person, deciding what is necessary in terms of our documentation? I, I, I agree with you totally that this, as a physician, the records were the, belong to the patient. That was hugely, hugely important. And I think that now, as some of the churches are voluntarily giving over um, the documents, if there's anything left that hadn't been previously, we are, we are hoping they will do that. But I do believe that, that, that families and survivors expect everything to be there for the examination, to be able to do this extraordinarily important work of identifying the children. Last week, Minister Bennett said the government's already earmarked $33 million in 2019 to implement the TRC's burial-related recommendations. But that $27 million has not yet been spent. Why wasn't this money spent since the 2019 budget? Thank you for the question. And again, um, as, as some of the money um, has been earmarked to the National Center on Truth and Reconciliation for their ability to keep comprehensive records that on deaths and, and burials and cemeteries that families can access. The, it was, the advice to us was that we must design a program that would meet the needs of Canadian, of, of all of the possible um, communities, the survivors, families, and that is the work that we did. And that is has resulted in a very flexible program where communities will be able to apply uh, for research, for gatherings, for commemoration, whatever the community needs. We now have a program that will be able to meet those needs uh, 
and and be able to help them unlock the healing and move forward. Let's also be extremely clear that the finding of the remains of these children was not an initiative set out by the federal government. It was an initiative funded by the provincial government. How much longer would we have been waiting if that didn't happen? This didn't happen because the federal institution cares. This happened because a provincial government cares. And this was brought to light because of a provincial government, not because of the federal government. So why is this suddenly such an urgent matter to distribute this money? Why was this not a priority of your department? It took the BC government's funding to uncover the mass grave in Kamloops. Do you think it is the federal government's responsibility to fund these searches? It most certainly is the federal government's responsibility to fund these searches. Um, and, and that is why in budget 2019, we put that money uh, aside for that purpose. I think um, in, the, in the case of Tecamloops, they've been working on this for 20 years. And, uh, and they were able to secure from the federal government uh, money from Heritage Canada in the in the pathways for healing, and we will we will move um, forward uh, with all other communities to be able to do to to take responsibility for for us to support communities in their way so forward. Now, not only does it sound like the federal institution didn't fund this, but they've been knowing about these kinds of initiatives for the last twenty years. It sounds like so they know that these kinds of things have been having to happen, needing to happen over the last two decades, just haven't put in the time, effort or funds. Minister Bennett, you use phrases like working at the speed of Indigenous communities until there is a political opportunity like we have seen in the recent weeks. Sorry, As an Indigenous person and a member of an Indigenous community, that is constant use of the use phrase insulting. We're ready for action now, not when the next tragedy occurs. And you need to get to action. Thanks for the time, Chair. Thanks very much. And so we, I think what we'll be able to do, uh, given the time left prior to the vote, is take uh, each of the parties on the next round, the two five minutes, and uh, Ms. Kakak and uh, Madam Bay Roof Bay for two and a half. So, uh, Mr. Malillo, can you go ahead for five minutes, please? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I thank the ministers for, uh, for joining us. Uh, today, I will direct my questions to Minister uh, Vandell. Uh, today, Minister, it's nice to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Um, you spoke about uh, quite a few topics that I'll hope to hope to get to them all in your remarks. Uh, but the, one of the big ones we've been um, talking a lot about, we've been seeing a lot about in recent reports, is about uh, housing in the north. Uh, we know that, that uh, there are housing shortages and housing issues with, with, with mold, with disrepair, with overcrowding. Uh, across the territories, across northern Canada, um, in particular, uh, Nunavut has been uh, is especially uh, has has, a, has many challenges. And I do know that the government has um, uh, has allocated funding towards us. Uh, you you spoke about that in your remarks, but uh, uh, the, the closing the gap uh, is is also something you say a lot. And and uh, the gap still remains quite large. Um, even with this funding. Uh, and it seems to me that the um, a lot of the bureaucracies that have been created um, uh, are, are not really getting the funds where they need to go to build these units in, in some cases, but uh, as well, um, your government's um, sort of anti-development approach to, to many projects, I believe, has, uh, has also uh, made it so that there, there are no real incentives for developers uh, to do their work as well and build new units. So I'm wondering if you can comment to that, uh, you know, Given that your government has spent so much uh, money, as you like to uh, uh, like to talk about all the time, uh, but uh, uh, the the results for uh, for people across the north just uh, it's just not getting the job done right now. Well, thank you, uh, thank you for that very important question on uh, on housing in the north and and in Nunavut. And uh, you're absolutely right; the gap is huge, and the gap was made uh, even more even larger uh, uh, when uh, previous to 2015, 10 years of, of complete non-funding by the previous government only exacerbated an already bad situation. You, you, have, you have been in government so, for six uh, years. So through since being elected in, in 2015, through our $70 billion 
national housing strategy. Our government has helped over 9,000 Northern families on housing issues, including finding homes for thousands of them. We've signed 10-year housing agreements with all three territorial governments, which were non-existent before, which will invest close to $800 million over those 10 years. We've signed a, uh, a $400 million housing agreement with Inuit's, Inuit right holders, which, uh, which will uh, invest housing in Inuit to Nunengat. Uh, and in the last budget, Minister, we've we've, me, we've inter- we're all allocating you know, an extra uh, 1.5 billion dollars. You know how many how many, housing units, in, you know how many units have been built uh, in the since territory 20, since 2015? We've helped 9,000 northern families on on issues concerning housing, including several thousand uh, new units. Okay, okay, so that'd be 9,000 housing units were built. Not uh, 9,000. 9, we've helped 9,000 families on important housing issues with uh, with at least several thousand uh, homes in the north. Okay, uh, by your estimate, uh, by the department work, how, how many units would you say are, are still needed? Hey, listen, listen the, the, uh, the, the gap in Northern housing is huge uh, due to chronic underfunding by, uh, by previous governments. And, and I'll be fair- And your government some, as well. Including some of our previous liberal governments, uh, but mostly zero funding for the previous 10 years by uh, uh, by the Harper government. Uh, but I will admit, Minister, I will Minister, admit, you, you, I will your, your admit, government I will has, admit has been in power for six that, years. I will admit six we years. need to do a better job uh, in breaking down barriers, uh, not only in Nunavut, but in Northwest Territories and in Yukon. In NWT, we've put together with the government of NWT a high level uh, tiger team with 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 senior senior deputy ministers from both governments to really take those barriers down i think it's i mean the funding is there why it's not flowing in as adequate a pace as it should uh needs to be addressed and we're committed to working with all three territorial governments and indigenous governments to do just that I'm happy that you mentioned that and that you acknowledge that, Minister, that the funding isn't flowing down where it needs to go. I think that that's very important because you do cite a lot of figures, as I there's, mentioned. You're, you're always talking about the funding that's going out the door, but we need these units. Better built. is always that's possible. That's, that's the bottom and, line. And, and that's my philosophy. We can always do better. Any government can do better. Yeah. And, yeah. and yours, yours certainly has to. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And Mrs. Zan for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Minister Bennett, I, I have a number of questions uh, that I'd like to ask you in a short amount of time. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, I, I know that it's not easy to change everything that has happened and overnight. Uh, here in Nova Scotia, uh, the Sibinigatig, Sibinigatig uh, First Nations community has already now started to search with an archaeological team on the grounds of the former uh, residential school there. And we are hoping that no bodies are found, but they do believe there were 16 children who had died uh, and they are going to be looking, they've already started last weekend to, to look. And uh, also they said that they ha- the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has listed these names and uh, the search will be led by an archaeologist of St. Mary's and the Mi'kmaq cultural heritage curator, Roger Lewis, who is also a member of Sibinigatig First Nation. So these are the types of things that obviously need to be done uh, in order to be able to find truth and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples across Canada. Now, given the possibility of police investigations of criminal behavior in some of these situations. What impact do you think police investigations will have on the current and future community-led investigations? Well, thank you so much for the question. And I think that even even the way you've asked the question is, is very, very important because what was very clear in Call to Action 76 is that these processes must be community-led and that the police uh, investigation needs to actually take guidance from the community and uh, that it is um it is important that that the protocols uh, have to be followed and that uh, that 
that even if the police have opened a file, they it's very clear that any future or further actions need to be taken in in consultation with the community in that uh, the, com the protocols are very different coast to coast to coast and it will be important to to work with the knowledge keepers and 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 the elders um, in each community to make sure um, that that this is done um, in a good way and with respect and um, and and with the spirit of those children in mind. I, I totally I totally agree. And I think that the sad part is that <clears throat> many of the stories are anecdotal, people remembering things, people remembering when somebody ran away and then was beaten or disappeared. Um, it, I mean, it's heartbreaking. And I'm sure that you have been going through a lot yourself with all of this latest news, which Sadly, uh, in truth and reconciliation has has unearthed so much information, and there is just so much more to to be addressed. Um, and very disturbing for residential school survivors and their families being re-traumatized with all of this this news. Um, Minister, you've said that the twenty seven million dollars in funding to support communities is flexible. So can you explain exactly what kinds of activities or initiatives would be eligible under this program? We have a minute. Go ahead. Yes, thank you for the question. And uh, and it is, uh, I, I did want to just share with the committee this amazing meeting that we had last evening with the National Center on Truth and Reconciliation and uh, Dr. Kona Williams, this inspiring, the the only Indigenous forensic pathologist in Canada who really has a, a, a lot to share with communities and, and making sure that, that everything is done with respect to the communities. And I think that the funding is truly flexible such that it can be for research, engagement, knowledge gathering, memorialization, commemoration, bringing children home um, in that some of the children might be at um, a at a distance, and communities want to to uh, bring their children home. So the 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 funding will be truly flexible, such that communities are are able to do what they know they need in order to unlock the healing. Thanks so much, Minister. And Thank for you. two and a half minutes to Madam Beru Bay. Merci, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is for ben Minister Bennett. I'd like to know, would it be possible to have in writing the response following our discussion on Kitsizakik, given they don't have running water or electricity? You said earlier that you'd perhaps be able to see what you could do. Thank you very much. Perhaps the Deputy Minister, Daniel Kwan Watson. Process. Oui, euh, nous serons très yes, we would be delighted to send you that information in writing. We will perhaps share the work with the Department of Indigenous Services Canada, which is full, who, who is fully involved. But between the two of us, yes, we commit to send you those things in writing. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I have another question. The time is flying by. Minister Benedict, you know that uh, uh, one gentleman has been negotiating with the federal government so that his reserve be recognized under the Indian Act, even though nobody likes that law and it's a perfect example of systemic racism. It's important to admit that knowing this could allow this this move could allow this community to have better funding and public services. So in this case, the question has to do with uh, the lands. Where are the negotiations at with this community concerning the creation of a reserve or arriving at it, an agreement that would allow them to get their land back? Thank you very much. It's very important for us as a government to m move towards uh, self-government. It's very important. And I think after this meeting, it's important to have a specific discussion on this community based on the facts. 
Thank you. Mr. Chair? Thank We're done, you. and Matt, Ms. Kakai, go ahead. Two and a half minutes. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering if we should just pause for you to let us know what the next little bit's going to look like with the vote. I just know we're like about five minutes from there. Well, we'll uh, suspend. We'll wait until the vote's conducted. And then we'll consider, uh, I think we'll be releasing our witnesses from this panel and then go to uh, Minister Miller for the next panel following the vote. So would I, I could do the two and a half minutes and then what we'll do? Well, you can ask your question now for the ministers here. And then we'll start all over again after the vote. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll just start now. That's fine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have one question for Minister Van Dell. It's a yes or no. As soon as it's safe to travel and when you are fully vaccinated, do you commit to visiting the land guardians in Minti Matalik or Pond Inlet to see the conditions of Baffinland's Mary River Mine? Yes or no, please. Absolutely, yes. And I am fully vaccinated as of eight days ago. Great, that's fantastic to hear. Thank you, uh, Minister. Back to Minister uh, Bennett. Last week, the minister said that explicit details on her action plan in response to murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry are still to come. The action plan finally came out and had no tangible action. Funding or timelines, and now we are supposed to wait for an implementation plan. Indigenous women and girls are dying while we wait for another plan from you. I want to touch on and just confirm uh, some of the things that have happened over the last uh, while. So in 2019, June, the Liberal government said that they would. Uh, Put, uh, give themselves, they gave themselves a timeline of a year to develop a plan of action. Uh, so in the minds of Canadians at that time would mean an implementation plan is being developed with key stakeholders. I brought this up uh, during uh, last summer and we had confirmed that even though there was the 12 month timeline it took five months for stakeholders to even get funding to start the work and then once we saw of course june 2020 there was an excuse of a covid uh, delay so we weren't going to see any movement on already a delay that this government had given themselves so uh, here we are in june of 2021 and we're still have yet to see action and things come to fruition. Uh, is that basically what's happened over the last year, uh, two, two years or so, Minister Bennett? Completely out of time, but I'll, I'll give you a okay. shot at trying to answer that. Thank you. Well, from the day we took office, uh, we began the work um, to launch the National Inquiry and then to be able to put in place things that that would really matter, like the family liaison units. We have been working very hard. We always said we wouldn't work, wait for the National Action Plan to be able to make those investments. And as you know, in the fall economic update, there were money for shelters in, in this budget, 2.2 billion, which has informed the federal strategy. And that federal action plan or implementation plan will be ready this year, but already the money will be flowing. In yeah. terms of the national action plan, um, that that is over a hundred indigenous women and two-spirited people leading that that process. It has been um, the first ever of this magnitude and we're very proud of the work that the Families and Survivors Circle have done with us uh, and, and they will lead this process with an excellent data strategy that'll make sure we're making progress, regular updates, Minister. and we 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 are going to end this tragedy. And we have to end this session uh, in suspension. Madam Beirube, point of order. I'm, uh... Oui, just une question concernant.
Yes, a question about the vote. Are we coming back to the committee right after voting, or do we wait for the results of the vote, and then we come back to the committee? I'd just like some clarity on that. Problems, we can we, we can get them resolved. Uh, thank you, ministers. We now suspend until after the vote.
the estimates, A2021-22. And with us now for video conference in the second hour, Minister of Indigenous Services, Mark Miller, accompanied by his senior officials, Christian Fox, Deputy Minister, Joanne Wilkinson, Senior Assistant Deputy Minister, Kelly Blanchett, Assistant Deputy Minister, uh, Philip uh, Thompson, Chief Finances, Results and Delivery Officer, and Dr. Tom Wong, Chief Medical Officer, Public Health, First Nations. Welcome, everyone. Mr. Miller, please go ahead with your opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. And uh, before I begin, uh, I, I understand you will not be renewing your term uh, next uh, next round, as well as MP Kakak. So I do want to extend all my greetings to you and 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 good luck in your future endeavors. And obviously, thank you for your service oh, thank to you. the House of Commons and, and Canada and your people. Kwekwe unusakut tansi. Hello, a bonjour. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge, as I'm in Ottawa, that I'm on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. First and foremost. I do want to say a few words for the communities and families, friends uh, impacted by the tragic news of the children whose remains were recently found at the former Kamloops Residential School based located on the traditional territory of the Kamloops Sahuaban people. Um, I want to like to thank the members for their continued advocacy for echo echoing uh, Indigenous voices here in Parliament. While this discovery was shocked and disturbed the nation for Indigenous peoples across the countries, these findings are deeply painful and traumatizing, triggering, um, though not surprising, particularly to Indigenous peoples who have known this truth for far too long. Our thoughts remain with the families and communities impacted not only by the discovery, but by the residential school system. It is essential that we respect, continue to respect the privacy space mourning period for those communities that are collecting their thoughts and putting together their protocols as to how to honor these children. Nous reconnaissons qu'il y aura un besoin continu. We recognize that there will be an ongoing need for well-being services related to childhood and intergenerational trauma, and we will continue to work with our partners and communities to ensure adequate access to the appropriate services. Survivors and families affected by the Indigenous residential school system can use the National Residential School Helpline when needed. The Health Support Program Answering Indian residential school questions also offers access to seniors, he traditional healers, and other cultural supports and emotional supports that are appropriate or f professional advice f on mental health. Furthermore, all Indigenous people can access the online, the helpline rather, the, or by phone. And in the context of the pandemic, we offer our additional support for Indigenous communities so that they can uh, adapt and uh, use these uh, mental health services. We have also recently announced $597.6 million over three years for a mental health strategy and well-being based on a distinctions-based program for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nations, which includes ongoing support for former uh, students of uh, residential schools and their families. This will support existing programs existing skills and will help uh, fill the gaps and and meet current needs that are emerging in future ones for Indigenous communities. 21, and to provide you with an update on continuing efforts to confront the evolving COVID-19 pandemic, I will also answer any other question that the committee chooses for this year. The total authority will be $18.9 billion and reflects a net increase of $5.4 billion. This includes Support for initiatives such as fundings for COVID-19 responses, including notably $760.7 million for the Indigenous Community Support Fund that has been so welcomed, $64 million for the continuation of public health responses in Indigenous communities, and $332.8 million for Indigenous communities affected by disruptions to their revenue due to COVID-19, which we announced and officialized and launched yesterday. Uh, the net increase for the supplementary estimates A also includes $1.2 billion for out-of-court settlements that to advance Canada's overall commitment to reconciliation by paving the way to a more respectful and constructive relationship with Indigenous peoples. It also includes $1.1 billion for child and family services to support a proactive agreement on a non-compliance motion before the CHRT. This funding is crucial. Since the CHRT issued its first order for Canada to cease its discriminatory practices in 2016, We've been working with First Nations leaders and partners to implement the tribunal's orders and we're in compliance. The $1.1 billion will go to communities that are engaging in activities that prevent 
the apprehension of kids and contribute to the transformation of the system that's been so broken. Let me be clear once again, we share the same goal. First Nations children historically harmed by the child welfare system will receive fair, just, and equitable compensation. The government is not questioning or challenging the notion that compensation should be awarded to First Nations children who are harmed by their historical discrimination and underfunding of the child welfare system. So the question is not whether we compensate, it is a question of doing so in a way that is fair, equitable, and inclusive of those directly impacted. To this end, we have already consented to certification of a consolidated class action filed by the federal court by the Assembly of First Nations and uh, counsel to Xavier Mishum regarding the same children that were harmed by the system as contemplated by the CHRT. Furthermore, we are currently in mediation with the partners, but as set out in the mediation agreement, those discussions out of respect will remain confidential. We remain committed to providing First Nations children access to the necessary supports and services and partnerships with Indigenous peoples. To that effect, it's important to note that 820,000 claims under Jordan's principles were processed since 2016, which represents close to $2 billion in funding. Most notably in January 2020, the Act Respecting First Nations Inuit and Métis Children, Youth and Families came into force. It is key to this conversation and transforming the relationship, which responds to the calls to action set and sets a new way forward. Indigenous governments and communities have always had the inherent right to decide over things that people like me take for granted, what is best for their children, their families, and their communities. The Act provides a path for them to fully exercise and lift up that jurisdiction. As a result of this work led by Indigenous communities, two Indigenous laws have now come into force under the federal law, the Wawasimung Independent Nations Law in Ontario and the Mio Pimati Sowing Act of Kaosis First Nation in Saskatchewan. In each of these communities, children will have greater opportunity to grow up and thrive immersed in their culture and surrounded by loved ones. Let's now speak about an update around COVID-19. Throughout the pandemic and still today, Indigenous Services Canada has been aware of the vulnerability, uh, increased vulnerability of Indigenous communities faced with the virus. From the beginning, we have taken immediate and decisive actions that were necessary to protect the communities as best as we could. Our absolute priority is health, safety and well-being of First Nations, Inuit and Métis. But without the dedication and determination of all leaders of First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities, none of this would have been possible. I'd like to thank them for their ongoing work over the last year, especially encouraging their communities to get vaccinated. As for the progression and deployment of the vaccination, as of June 7th, 687 Indigenous communities with have vaccinations underway. In total, 540,581 doses have been administered. First and second doses. This means that over 41% of eligible individuals in the communities, as well as people eligible living on the territories, have received two doses of the vaccine, which include people 12 years and older. This means for the people who've had a first dose, 80%, and if we count uh, people dues uh, at 12 years and older, even uh, more. In, as as of ninth, the 9th of June, in the First Nations communities, we are aware of 761 active cases, which unfortunately, which happily is a decrease from last year. This brings us to a little over, well, 35,000 cases confirmed, to 25,000. Thousand uh, cases and 348 deaths. Bob, est-ce qu'il me reste du temps? Allez-y. Finalement, je voudrais parler d'une question essentielle pour les Premières Nations, et c'est l'eau potable. Nous voulons veiller à ce que toutes les Premières Nations aient accès à une eau potable. En date du 9 juin, des Premières Nations, avec l'appui de services aux autochtones. There was 105 in effect. Uh, in 2019, we've increased that support funding for operations and maintenance, which is a, a key demand of First Nations. Sorry, uh, and with, the, with these Chair, increases, can we just check interpretation? It just went really weird there for for a yeah, second. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Minister. English and it went to French for me. Yes, the same thing's happening here, Mr. Clerk. Uh, it seems to be jumping back and forth uh, the translation, uh, whatever one selects.
should be resolved now, Mr. Chair. Oh, All right. Yeah. Uh, conclude briefly, yeah, Mark. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, in in 2019 and 2020, we increased funding to support the operations and maintenance of wastewater systems. With these increases, by 2025, 2026, over $400 million per year in permanent funding will be provided, and that's four times um, what, what 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 folks currently are attributed. That'll be key and transformative into maintaining the lifespan of these key infrastructure assets in community and uh, and securing uh, clean water for everyone. These added funds will have that tangible effect that I've mentioned um, and will contribute to health, safety, health, safe water and safe and healthy communities. I want to thank you again all for this community. And now I'm quite happy to take any and all questions. Miigwech, Nakumik, Marci Cho. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Vidal, it's your first start for six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister, for being here today. You know, we always appreciate your time. Um, Minister, you know, I'm all about talking about, uh, we, we've had this conversation before about outcomes and results and, and some of those kinds of things. And I just got a couple quick questions up, up front that I, I will ask you to be brief in your answers so I can get to the substance of a couple other questions after. Um, your department has committed $43.7 million over five years to co-develop a legislative framework for First Nations policing that recognizes First Nations policing as an essential service. Um, we recently completed a study on, on exactly that. And when we had um, officials from four different departments at committee, not a single one of those people could actually define what policing as, as an essential service was. Does, would that frustrate you that nobody from the department actually had a definition for what we're aiming for? I think MP Vidal, I think it's frustrating to Indigenous communities who have been, uh, again, when I spoke about things we take for granted, certainly uh, people look like me take policing for, for granted. And so um, there, there's an element in here that's important to highlight. My community, my, my, my department uh, deals with sort of a companion aspect of, of policing as an essential service, as a relationship partner with um, public safety. The bulk of that will be led by Minister Bill Blair, firstly, as he continues to fund um, the First Nations policing program, but then expand it and do the consultation work necessary to uh, define and reflect the needs of communities, um, whether it's in treaty areas or anywhere across Canada, where that service is needed for the health and safety of community and foremost for, um, for, for women uh, and children. And this key, key response to the, to the MMIW uh, calls for justice and the TRC report. Uh, so yes, absolutely, it's frustrating, but there is also an aspect of this which needs, we, we need that impact in, uh, input from communities to keep working with communities and putting forth a piece of legislation that will recognize that essential service. The part that I'm responsible for- Thank you, thank you. Clear, Minister, in, I, in I want to keep going. I'm going to run out of time, please. sorry. Yeah, yeah no, I know. I just wanted to press I, what I do. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I, I've got so much I want to do here quickly. Yeah. You you spoke about, uh, you spoke about child and family services and, and the- uh, um, you know, I think you referenced a couple of First Nations that have made that, that uh, or completed that journey or moving down that journey of taking over their responsibility. Um, I've asked you this question before, and, I, and maybe that is a simple answer. Is there so far just two First Nations that have um, indicated their, their desire to do that? And just where are we at in that process? I think based on some of the events of the last few weeks here, it's so very important that we deal with some of the current issues as well. And having First Nation control of some of their child and family services is important. I'm just wondering how how fast that is happening. If you could, you know, briefly respond, and then I want to get into one more detailed question, if I could. Yeah, and, and I'll be quite frank. It's slow. Um, the, the the certainly the pandemic, what people have focused on their health and safety of the communities have have resulted in in slowdown. We, this is a revolutionary piece of, uh, of of legislation that lifts up the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples. We have um, dozens and dozens of communities across the Canada that have expressed interest. There's about 500 million uh, or more in, in the fall economic statement that was dedicated to, to working on capacity, to putting those laws forward and, 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 and entrenching them. We want to make sure we have proper coordination agreements in place with provinces that hold a bulk of that responsibility. So there's a, there's a, there's a relationship aspect there with the provinces, including your home province, that we can't discount in all this. Um, but there are many more, and there's some that have lifted up their own legislation and said, we, we're not necessarily interested in C92, but this is how we're going to protect our children. So that has some validity as well. We're, we're very cautious in those estimates, um, but I would say for the benefit of this uh, committee that there are dozens and dozens that have um, some good work along the way. There's some difficult challenges ahead in and around capacity, so I won't hide that from you, but it is a long road and it is part and parcel of everything that we've seen in the last week. Thank you. Um, and probably, probably one final question. Um, COVID-19 magnified the realities of some of the jurisdictional quagmires around Indigenous people in urban, in, in urban settings. You and I have had the conversation many times about friendship centers and 
you know, the funding that, that it took some time to kind of make it through the community support funding um, process for the, for the urban Indigenous folks. Um, friendship centers offer a variety of services that, that actually are as diverse as the communities they serve. And, and I know friendship centers across the country are looking for a kind of a longer term commitment so that they can plan for their futures. They can invest in infrastructure. They can, you know, make sure they have commitments to programs that are ongoing and make good, efficient decisions. Is there anything going on with any of the budget work or the estimate work that would provide that long-term commitment for friendship centers that serve urban Indigenous people? Yeah, certainly in budget 2021 MPV Dow, there, there, um, there is a large pot of, um, of funding for, for, inf for infrastructure that we are currently parsing out and, and working with, uh, mem with community members um, to see how that would fold out based on need, based on shovel-ready projects. So there is, um, there's, there, there's a lot of light of hope at the end of the tunnel. Uh, certainly the amounts that we've announced through the Indigenous Community Support Funds through COVID, of which there will be four or five waves, the latest one went out last week, has a rubric, that it, uh, an envelope that is dedicated to the work that Friendship Centers are doing, serving Indigenous communities um, off reserve. Also room for tribal councils serving their people that live outside their communities. So that's an important element and aspect to it. Um, is but that sorry, we, but is, is that beyond COVID-19 though, Minister? Is that longer term well, beyond it, it, ongoing funding beyond? Yeah, and, and I guess what I was trying to say is there, there's been some immense work done under COVID that has been informative of the work that we will be doing going forward and, and highlighting that relationship. It is a different one than a nation to nation relationship, obviously with friendship centers that have a different form of governance and, and others that serve community members. Um, but it's one that we want to work, uh, work towards know, knowing the number of people that live, uh, of Indigenous folks that live outside their home communities. It is so key in there. There is um, in budget 2021, although it, it, it was not specifically earmarked, but there will, there is, um, there will be some funding for, um, for urban, urban Indigenous initiatives. That's the time there. Thank you very much. Adam Vancouver, six minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Monsieur uh, le Ministre. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two questions for you, Minister. We'll see if I have time for my second one. 2020, uh, the Act Respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis Children, Youth and Families came into effect in, in order to affirm the jurisdiction of Indigenous communities over child and family services. How will this Act support the well-being of Indigenous children and families, uh, provide culturally relevant care to children, and could you please provide an update on the implementation of this Act? So what we've seen throughout, and particularly it's become quite poignant and, and, and top of mind in the last week, is that um, we, we uh, Canada provinces has been administering a broken system for some time. Um, and so we can talk about compensation, which is very important. When we talk about transformation, that's when we have to talk about the, the legislation that was passed just before the prior election, um, which is a shift in a culturally, uh, in the spirit of self-determination, shifting a system that was been focused on one of prevention, not culturally appropriate to one that is rather from intervention to prevention. Um, and that is what, um, when, it's, when it's embodied and ensconced in the language of self-determination, um, is, is an effort to lift up communities in how they, um, how they protect their own. And again, uh, something that we've taken for, for granted, uh, it is long work, it requires an intense amount of consultation. There was uh, about $500 million in the fall economic state de statement dedicated to uh, building capacity. That is something that will be deployed over five years. Additional investments will be required as communities bring home their children and pass their legislation to lift it up. I wouldn't say, and when I said to Gary that it was slow, um, there is an important principle that was embodied in when the law came into force, and that is the minimum standard of the child. Um, so it is, a, it is a signal to all of Canada and to courts that they can no longer, um, lo no longer sanction practices which remove disproportionately Indigenous children from their families based on issues such as poverty. Um, and that is um, still uh, the challenge uh, for every single uh, government in the future to keep combating uh, poverty discrimination that is a legacy of our colonial past. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Monsieur uh, le Ministre, pour ma deuxième. Thank you very much for my second question. Now, on June 2nd, the coroner spoke about Joyce Ishaquan. And we learned new details of the poor treatment that Joyce Ishaquan was subjected to. What plans are in place to fight against Indigenous racism in the health system? And how 
will this government make sure that indigenous individuals, especially women, will have fair access to health care? I have to say, and I presume that this is the case for the rest of Canada, who attended the coroner's session or the report on it. This is a, a live, the lived experience of some, if not all, indigenous peoples who apprehend the health system. They're often treated as second-class citizens. Now, during the coroner's inquest, we heard things that reflected their lived experience, especially in places where they're most vulnerable. I'm almost in contact. I'm in contact with them almost daily, the, the husband of Joyce. And they're going through this with great courage. And they're still going through a very difficult time. But as I said earlier, this has been the experience of many Indigenous peoples in the health care system in Canada. And of course, the provinces keep this jurisdic jurisdiction throughout Canada. I have the mandate to put in place distinctions-based legislation that would fight systemic racism in the system. And there are a number of things that have to happen at the same time. But of course, this would be a long-term reform. There have been jurisdictional conflicts in the past. We have announced in the budget about beyond more than $100 million in honor of Joyce Echequan to fight racism in the healthcare system directly. And I'd like to highlight that. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Chair, I'd like to give the rest of my time over. It will be much appreciated by uh, Madam Bayroubet and others. Sylvie, please go ahead. Six minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am in the traditional territory of the uh, Algonquin and the Cree, and I'm currently in my Val d'Or office. Thank you, Minister and all witnesses. My question is for Mr. Miller. In the budget 2019, the government had announced $33.8 million over three years for the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the Prime Minister and yourself have repeated that the government invested this money. Do you agree with me that a budgetary statement is without value if the amounts earmarked have not been authorized, yes or no? Where I agree with you is that I am not presenting any apologies for the deployment of these funds. As you know, this is a very sensitive subject uh, for, to accompany uh, Indigenous individuals in their grief. And this is very invasive and uh, difficult for these individuals, and it can take time to get answers. Individual, indigenous peoples want answers. Now, the Treasury Board made approvals, and the government's ready to help communities who want to uh, do these uh, searches. It's not easy because it's a very uh, sensitive topic. There are protocols established, but I don't think that there are that there is a community with protocols established for this type of atrocity. So we're going to give them space and time. But this should not be interpreted as an excuse to not deploy this money. And if there is a need for additional support and government expertise, we will be there for them. So, Minister, yesterday in response to a journalist who asked you about the $27 million yesterday, you said the amount was announced in the 2019 budget. Now, very recently, the amount is available. Uh, I could do the research, but the money is definitely available. So can you please tell me if this amount is really uh, part of the supplementary estimates that we're looking at today? Yes, and perhaps I can hand it over to one of my experts who are here. I don't have uh, the answer that was asked to me by the journalist yet. Mr. Thompson, Chief Finances, Results and Delivery Officer, there was reference to the $27 million. This amount is in the 
budget of the Crown and Indigenous Relations budget. It's not part of the supplementary estimates that we're studying today, that $27 million. And when we study public accounts of Canada for 2019-2020 and the uh, budgetary estimates for the following three years, one notices that this money was not uh, earmarked except for $3.2 million, which is in the supplementary estimates of 2020-2021. So can you explain to me what happened to the rest of the $33.8 million? If I'm not mistaken... Of course, this falls under Minister Bennett's portfolio, but you, I can be corrected on the amount if necessary. This money was given to the Center for Truth and Reconciliation, if I'm not mistaken. Please correct me if I'm wrong. That is also my understanding that funding is not part of uh, the reference to our department, so I can't really give you any more information than that on that amount, unfortunately. And would you agree with me that the, in reality, the amount announced in the 2019 budget was never spent by the government and was not authorized through votes? Can you please explain that to me? Philip? Yes, if the money had not been spent and the department could not spend that money, unfortunately, I am not able to speak to the amounts that were approved in the budget, which was not part of the department's uh, reference levels for Indigenous services. So it's difficult for me to give you a more detailed answer than that. So it was blocked at the Treasury Board? Is that what you think? I can't say precisely because, as I said, if the money had been earmarked for the Department of Crown Relations, then it's their budget process that takes place, and we don't really have any role in that area. It would really be my colleagues from the Department of Indigenous Relations who could give you more details on the way that money was accessed, if it was accessed, and if it was, if it was spent or not. And Mr. Chair, in December, I received an answer from one of my questions around uh, uh, calls to action 81 to 82. And in the answer, the government told us that 0 0.5 uh, employees were uh, used for these calls to action. And let's remind everyone that this has to do with building commemorative monuments uh, in Ottawa. So I'll ask the question I asked the other day. Do you not think that it's insufficient for carrying out this call to action? Once again, Ms. Beribé, this mandate falls under the heritage portfolio or the Minister for Indigenous Relations. Of course, we'd like to see it go forward, given what's happened over the last week. Madam Kakak, uh, Ms. Kakak, please go ahead for six minutes. Matna, thank you, Chair. The budget allocates $25 million to Nunavut for housing construction. This would result in the construction of only 100 new homes across the massive territory. The government of Nunavut has said that the territory needs 3,000 new houses immediately. In about 30 seconds, can you give me the rationale for this low figure? Yes, and thanks, MP, MP Kakak. I, I want to just thank you for your advocacy um, for your people. I, I think we are currently under discussions with ITK um, for their needs and infrastructure. Housing will be a huge amount of that. That's part of the $6 billion that was announced in Budget 2021. So um, that number that you quoted is only a small part of the discussion that's ongoing, and I believe there will be positive news in the near future, as is needed, absolutely. As you and I saw on my housing tour, the reality of housing in the North is horrifying, unsafe, overcrowded, and moldy homes are the norm. 
I was surprised to see that the supplementary estimates added an extra $40 million for Inuit-specific housing. Can you tell me why this extra funding was included? Again, in about 30 seconds would be great. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer on that particular line, line item. Perhaps Philip does. Great. Uh, do you have any idea then how this money may be distributed or, or who it might be funneled through? Yeah, as you know, we um, we announced 400 million in housing that in partnership with um, with the territory, uh, and so that is that those are monies that we have dedicated throughout our governmental budgets. But as to that particular line item, I don't have an answer. For you. NTI or Nunavut Dungavik Incorporated requested 500 million dollars in the budget to fund housing development for Inuit housing in Nunavut, and yet. This government offered a measly $40 million for Inuit across Canada. NTI said that Inuit's needs for housing is as great as Inuit Nungangat combined. The $500 million was a short-term emergency ask. It's a bare minimum ask. And even though you included more money for Inuit housing, it would still be less than a fifth of what was requested. That's like needing $5 and getting a quarter. That's an outrage. Why didn't this government at least budget the requested $500 million for housing in Nunavut? And I, I want to highlight the work that um, NTI and ITK have worked towards putting a number uh, in the ask. They've done amazing work in, in, in trying to quantify that housing need and infrastructure needs generally. Um, we are currently working with them to, uh, to work on allocations in the context of the $6 billion that was announced for infrastructure as part of Budget 2021. That is transformative, um, but we will continue those talks with them, and um, I hope to have some, uh, some good news in, in the coming months. That still doesn't really explain the rationale behind the less than a fifth of the funding that's needed just for, it's an emergency ask. It really doesn't capture the true uh, true nature of what is really needed uh, in the territory. It's just a, it's a band-aid solution for what's needed uh, right now even. And so even 500 million, you could say, is something that's even too low within Nunavut. And then this government decided to ballpark it even lower. Um, so have you read uh, the housing report that I put out from last last year? Um, I have only only the highlights I've read in the ITK's proposal on um, on how they would like to deal with housing. I, I'm sure my team has, um, but I would just add the qualification that in terms of the numbers that you were citing, it is a very small part of the picture of what we will be announcing for uh, the North. That said, I will acknowledge that in terms of the 10-year plan, the amounts in the budget are not sufficient to, to close that gap, and that is work that we'll have to be relentless in investing in over the future. So I guess then you wouldn't be able to tell me what the title was or what communities were involved or I guess anything that that stood out particularly because I traveled for three three weeks and, and did a lot in that time. And so would you be able to recall anything like that from the report? Um, what I did watch was your uh, particularly your social media in and around your tour uh, and some of what you highlighted. And certainly I've read the reports that um, that um, the partners have put together as to the dire housing needs, and I'm ready. I will readily acknowledge them. And I, I, I it, it is from anything I've heard in terms of our COVID deployment and the contact that I've had. Unfortunately, I've not had the chance to visit, and I would like to. Um, all, all of that uh, rings true. So, since you followed and and may have looked at things briefly, you might remember some quotes like, uh, "One unit had 14 people living in it with only four bedrooms. A child was so frequently sick due to mold that a child was placed in foster care." Uh, Minister, how would you tell me to respond uh, if instead of Naya or Kogloktok, my report had? Uh, say Nuns Island or Griffin Town, and if I was the minister in charge and was told you to keep waiting, how would you respond to that? What would you tell me to do? How would you uh, take that? And, and with great respect, MP Kekak, I know what you're asking me, but I would never um, try to place myself in your shoes. I think your words speak for themselves. That's not what I'm asking, but um, uh, thanks for avoiding uh, the clear um, relation I'm trying to make. And I think that's my time, Chair. Thank you. It is. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ms. Kakak. And now we go to 
Uh, to complete the round of questioning, we'll have each of the parties speak, uh, Mr. Vierson, uh, Mr. Batiste, Sylvie, and uh, Mumalak one more time, and that will take us the time. So, Arnold Vierson, five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister Miller, I, I have been just looking over the TRC report once again, um, and it strikes me, uh, driving around my own riding, that the the amount of money spent on residential schools was not the problem. Uh, some of these structures are the most imposing structures on our on our landscape in northern Canada. Um, it's not a matter of the money; it's a matter of the outcomes. Um, your government continually touts the amount of money that they spend, and yet we see a very much a lack of outcomes. Um, so, are you still committed to implementing the TRC report uh, recommendations? Yes. Uh, are you satisfied with the nine recommendations that you've achieved so far in the last six years? I won't be satisfied till they're fully complete. Um, what What has been the holdup? Um, and I would qualify your earlier question. There are a great number of them that are underway. Uh, currently, the, le the legislation under C91, C92, uh, the immigration oath, uh, currently the, the, um, the movement on the National Recognition Day, um, as well as UNDRIP, which your party opposed, um, are all key to transforming the relationship. I think one of them is trust. Uh, certainly, you mentioned money, money, and you put forward a false dichotomy. Obviously, we want to see progress from the money. Um, but we have to be relentless in our investment. This is about closing socioeconomic gaps, and the record shows that that has moved, closing the financial gap in education, closing the financial gap um, in all the other investments in infrastructure, um, action, and health and investments. Action These are all things seven, that have happened. Action and 71 through 76. Things. Action 71 through 76 um, were actionable five years ago. Why is it? Why are we not working on it till today? These are all items that um, that we have started to work on, and clearly, when it when we talk about uh, recognizing and and, and and doing something that is immensely sensitive, um, which is which is going over uh, burial sites that are crime scenes and perhaps considered sacred at the same time, this is something where communities have to lead. Um, I make you know obviously over so it's the first nations. Week, the first nations are the barrier. That's absolutely not what I said. First Nations lead, they take the decisions and the federal government will be there. This is an equivocation. This is the, how the relationship is built. Um, we will Obviously, the last two weeks have, um, have focused people's minds on this, but this is something the Indigenous communities have known for decades. In the case of Kamloops, they've been working on it, uh, as Minister Bennett said, for over two decades. Um, and we'll continue with communities. There are some communities that have reached out, MP Viersen, and they want to accelerate their searches. There are other communities that said they are not ready, but they're always they're at the same time worried about being left behind and not having... Um, financial commitment. So if ever you have the honor of, of your party uh, coming into power, uh, I, I hope that you will undertake today to fund those adequately as well as uh, you yourself complete the, the, the truth and reconciliation calls to action as they regard the federal government because this is something that is of all stripes and parties need to dedicate to um, and um, despite the great actions of some of your members that are sitting on this, on, on this um, committee today, I haven't I would, seen that as a group in your party. I would remind you that uh, Stephen Harper was the one that apologized for the government's actions on, in terms of the, uh, and also kickstarted the Truth and Reconciliation. And then um, cut funding the next day. Uh, over the boil water advisories continue to be a, a challenge for the federal government. Um, your government promised that they would be dealt with uh, a year ago. Um, we are seeing more communities come on to boil water advisories again. Uh, on what day or will we be out of the bush on that? Well, I'd encourage you to, to look at the revamp website, which was, um, we had some assistance with a great Indigenous organization so that every Canadian could see what the progress of those are. Let's recall that um, on, in 2015, there were 100 105 long-term water advisories in effect. We've lifted 107. This is an immense amount of progress. There remains uh, work to be done. A lot of the communities, um, despite having lost the construction year during, due to COVID, uh, have pushed through. We've announced additional funding. A lot of communities have said to us, when we put on a date, where will you be after that date? Because of that trust that I mentioned earlier that is so thin vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the federal government. It's why in November we announced additional operations and maintenance money and acceleration funds um, for those communities where costs have gone up, as well as looking beyond what lifting a long-term water advisory, which I will remind, remind the committee, is done by the nation themselves. And while it may seem easy to lift an advisory, the community sometimes will hesitate legitimately. If you've been on it for 25 years, you can perhaps think you're gonna, you can 
legitimately think you're going to take your time before taking that decision because it's about the health of the community. So yeah. these how, things do take time. How many the commitment to community? How many of the twenty eight for them? How many of the current twenty eight drinking water advisories that are short term do you expect to turn into long term? Um, I'd ask. I don't know if I get you an answer today. We I ex I expect none of them to turn to long term. Um, but it's a community by community analysis, and one of that you hit the nail on the head on that one because we've lifted. 100 or 100 plus i mean it, it is it is it is in the 100 182 uh, sh short term water advisories that we've made the investments sufficient so that they don't turn to long term that means safety wa safety of water in communities but we need to take a look at water safety from a greater perspective simply than building the building lifting the long term water advisory and walking away from this this is about partnership and making sure that asset has a long term lifespan that is um, at the height of its technology and worth to the community that means at the grassroots um, in, in the spirit of self-determination with funds of the federal government to support it so that they um, are what they are, which is the pride of their community and getting water to their people. Uh, that's our time. Thanks very much. And uh, Jaime Batiste, five minutes. Thank you for joining us, Minister, and um, <clears throat> sitting here listening to the questions. I, I can't help but reflect. Uh, I've been in First Nation advocacy and leadership for 20 years, and I remember the time where all of the issues related to Indigenous people uh, were under one ministry, and now we have two, and you could add uh, Minister Vandal as, as a third. And I couldn't imagine uh, a time, you know, as we progress, where the fact that we have two ministers is, are, is, is a, to me, a great thing and a, and a good thing moving forward in terms of making sure that we have a lot of different people looking at the important issues of Indigenous people in Canada. And I, and I also want to thank you for your speech in the House uh, during the uh, de debate on how we move forward past uh, what, what the findings of the Indian residential school in Kamloops with the 215 children's bodies. And I thought it was very powerful when you spoke the names and I, I lit uh, some, I did some smudging in my house when you were doing, you were talking about those names and I really thought that was powerful. Um, and you know, all across the, the country, we have communities uh, grieving. We have communities triggered by by the findings. And you know, in, in my community, we have a, a crisis center, a Sony crisis center, and they've been having a, a sacred fire outside uh, and helping survivors uh, who who needed to talk and helping people. And you know, that's it. Really shows the importance and 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 why why we need to continue to fund mental health. And I just want to. Get a sense from you. Can you speak to the need and some of the supports that we're offering for mental health in in First Nations communities across Canada? Yeah, and, and thanks for uh, that uh, comment, MP Baptiste. I, I, those names were in the in the TRC report, but I thought, uh, given the context, they should be read into uh, the record of the House of Commons so that they will always be remembered. And, um, I think there are more names to come, and that's I think what's gripped the whole entire country, including your community, um, and and really triggered a number of people. Some of the most poignant testimony I've heard is those people who are not um, prepared to speak about these things. They haven't cried since they were 15. Um, it's a recurring theme that I've heard. And when communities reach out and say they are not ready for this, but will you be there when we are? The answer is yes. Um, and those that are and want to accelerate things, we will be there for them. Um, what we have engaged completely, although um, my team that's here today is reaching out to communities get a sense of what mental health needs are. They're obviously there are the mental health needs that I highlighted in my introduction, but um, you know, obviously a, a phone line as important as it is, uh, is not sufficient. And this is magnified as well by what we've seen through COVID, which is an increased stress on, on uh, Indigenous communities mental health. Um, one of the budget items that, uh, that uh, was announced in budget 2021 was over $500 million for um, mental health supports. Um, we don't do very well as a government or as, as a country in talking about mental health. Um, some of us that are uh, probably best to speak about it don't, um, and those that are not so good do, um, and I'm the, the, the latter, but that is my job. And I, I think it is, it is important to recognize that everyone in the country is hurting, um, and this, even far after um, some of the news stories will, will die down, uh, people will, be, will remain hurting and triggered, uh, as well as the effects of intergenerational trauma. So for the immediacy of the communities in question, we've deployed um, uh, additional mental health supports, uh, perimeter security, as you can imagine, but also working with FNHA, as you know, is, is first in class in BC and, and doing some great work with um, health resources in communities. 
Um, but the mental health support is yet to be fully understood and engaged in as it is um, as it relates to the particular events that have happened in the last two weeks. Um, but we're getting a sense of that, and it is one that um, is very important and again magnified by, by COVID. Minister, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll try to be brief with this question. You know, the the Eskasoni Crisis Center has, in my community, has has been um, looking for funding, and uh, I'm not asking for a funding. But do you feel the best? as it relates to mental health. Obviously, that is no excuse for the federal government stepping back when there is a need, but it is a further reminder that we need to do so in partnership and not with Ottawa top-down approaches. Thanks very much. Madam Bayrube, two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Miller, Recently, you revealed a map on your department's website that identifies the Indigenous communities that don't have access to drinking water, and yet there's a, an Indigenous community that's not on that map and that doesn't have running water either. It's Kitsizakik, which is in my writing. So why is Kitsizakik invisible? Ms. Beroube, you're talking about Kitsizakik. Negotiations are underway for the, for moving the community, and that's discussions with the province. That's where things are at with this community. There's discussions about moving the community, so we'll be there for them. In Quebec, there is no boil water advisory, and that's because of very hard work we've done that's been done over the years, especially for needs to ident especially for identifying communities who are under the federal uh, under the federal uh, jurisdiction would it be possible to give us a written answer uh, about those negotiations mr miller yes Earlier, you were talking about the revealing of the 250 children's remains. We know that it's possible that there are other discoveries that will happen in other provinces across the country. Do you have an idea of what you can do to help communities who are grieving and who have mental health problems, as you described earlier? Yes, absolutely. And this is just the point, this is just the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately. The report from the Commission on Truth and Reconciliation said it. There could be two or three or four thousand people or even more. As Senator Sinclair said recently, we'll be there for the communities, as I said in English. There are some communities who aren't ready. Some, uh, some elders haven't even cried since they were teenagers. There are communities who do want to speed things up, and for those communities, we'll be there for them, whether it's to support them financially, but also governmental expertise. I must take into account the role of the Quebec government, Ms. Lafrenière. We have a very good relationship with her in supporting communities, but we won't do anything without the community's consent. That being said, this is no excuse to take our time. We will be there, all while respecting the community's consent. And, uh, Ms. Kakak, you have two and a half minutes. Thank you, Chair. The supplementary budget, the supplementary budget estimates 
sorry, the supplementary budget estimates include 1.2 billion in funding for out of court settlements for indigenous legal cases. The legal system has failed indigenous peoples countless times. Where do you expect that money to be used? Thanks, MP Kekek, and, and I will acknowledge that the, the legal system in Canada has failed Indigenous peoples. I think it's one of the present challenges we face as a government to continue doing so, where we are in disagreement in a, in a respectful way, and obviously out of court is the preferred way to do so. Um, I'd ask my team to specify those numbers because I'm aware of many cases, and if they could just break down quickly what those numbers comprise. I think as well, we can give you a of, response to. out of court is the way that the federal institution has forced this to go. Residential school survivors should be compensated and they shouldn't have to sue the government to settle out of court to get their money. Why is the government willing to spend more than a billion dollars in court settlements, but not ensuring indigenous peoples have access to basic human rights like housing? Well, this touches on a question that I perhaps couldn't answer in the time remaining, but um, closing those socioeconomic gaps, talking about those issues that uh, that have driven um, the, in the inequities and, and, and violations of human rights is key. Um, we don't want to get into a court process, um, but again, people that have suffered harm need to be compensated. Transforming the system is a part of that. And as you note, by implication, no single court case can transform the system when it comes to child and family care as C92 can and aspires to. Um, as well as all the transformative pieces of legislation in around uh, language as an inherent right and um, that form of reparations that we need to do to transform Canada into what uh, people believe it to be, but um, frankly with the news in the last two weeks is not. It's also really difficult to hear the excuse of Indigenous communities not being ready. Indigenous communities have been ready for basic human rights for decades, have been ready for the right to self-determination and equality for decades. So I'd like to, I'd like you to start talking the talk and uh, sorry, start walking the walk instead of just talking the talk and go to communities this summer before your government forces an election. Minister Miller, I invite you to go up to communities like the Lorioc and Sanikiloac to see the conditions of the people that live there. Inuit have always said they want ministers to come up and experience day-to-day -day living. So like I said, walk with communities instead of just talking about the importance of them. Matna. Thanks, Ms. Kakak. And that brings us to the end of the uh, minister's uh, role today. Mr. Miller, thanks so much uh, for staying with us for as long as we were able to. And a uh, very interesting conversation. Thank you, committee. Now, committee, in view of uh, the discussion we had, I didn't hear any challenges with regard to the SUPS specifically. So uh, are we uh, unanimous in consenting to uh, call the vote as a group and adopt uh, the subs on division any anyone opposed to that let's we'll see any opposition so uh, we'll call uh, the um, unanimous consent for the subs as presented and so having adopted sorry chair I'm just sorry. A clarification did we pass it unanimously or pass it on division well we can do whatever you want we can do it on division if you'd like yeah i think we usually do it on division okay we'll do that on division uh, i just I thought we had unanimity, but we have it on division. So, uh, so all in favor? Hands. Uh, any opposed? Opposed, uh, Madam Bay Ruby? Okay. Thumbs up. Okay. Ooh. Passes. Four. And, and so, um, having adopted the supplementary estimates, uh, Shall I report the supplementary estimates A2021-22 to the House? On division, all in favor? I see hands all around. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. That passes. Thank you, everyone. We meet again next on Tuesday with witnesses for our trafficking study. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved, Chair. Thanks, Ms. Dan. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you for a very um, interesting uh, committee meeting today. Thank you.